The following content is meant purely for educational and informational purposes and should not be relied upon as financial, investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. This is the Fundamentals Podcast, where we demystify crypto and help you navigate this ever-evolving internet native economy. In this episode, we're joined by Victor Fisher, the managing partner at Rockaway X, a venture capital firm backing leading Web3 funds and founders. Over the next hour, we dive into details around the current state of the crypto market and speak about Rockaway X's unique position as builders and users, in addition to being investors. We speak about the differences between modular and monolithic blockchains from an investor's point of view, their pros and cons, what Rockaway X's framework is for assessing value accrual throughout the modular tech stack, the best KPIs for performance assessment, and what the future of the blockchain market sector could look like. Victor walks us through the current pain points within our industry, where more capital should be allocated, what founders should be more mindful of when growing their businesses, and the current challenges related to educating the traditional world of crypto. Tune in for a great discussion about the current state of the crypto market from Rockaway X's point of view. Hello, Victor. Welcome to the Fundamentals Podcast. It is great to have you on. Hi, Oscar. Thank you so much. Of course. I've been looking forward to this one because, I mean, it has a very timely topic, everything that's happening in the blockchain market sector. One big thing is the development of modular blockchains and trying to understand how value accrues throughout that stack. And I know that you have some great thoughts and frameworks you have been putting together on that topic. So looking forward to diving into those and your approach to that market sector at Rockaway X. But before we start diving into the details behind that, it would be great if you can just give us a quick introduction to Rockaway X. So, you know, the fun specs and your purpose. So my background, I was, before founding Rockaway X, I was at McKinsey. And before that, I was an entrepreneur. And I realized back in like 2016, 17, that, you know, we, we needed, I would say, a more financial view on this industry. Also, like, I'm born in a communist country, so... And blockchain just represents freedom because, you know, we were forbidden to like go outside of the, of our borders, but finally, you know, with blockchain, I can connect to Aave and I can borrow against my ETH. I can send the transaction cross border with like very minimal fee. So I was very excited by the tech, but always missing the, you know, PNL and balance sheet view. So that's why I was in discussion with talk internally very early because you guys have kind of like the, the view, financial view that I was missing initially. And right now, I don't know, six, seven years in, we are 38 people. We manage $500 million, but we are mainly builders. So we do products ourselves. So we have three divisions. One is VC, that's 350 million of the 500. We do early stage investments, but also we invest into funds. I think we have over 30 funds in our portfolio, ranging from A16Z, crypto to some, you know, topic specific funds like Bitcraft for on gaming or one confirmation or, or six, five, two, nine capital or, or low random, for example, on NFTs. So very like domain specific funds as well. That's in the VC. Second division is a credit fund through which we provide liquidity to protocols. And third division is engineering. We run infrastructure blockchains from testnet, devnet to mainnet around 14 blockchains. We are also part of the LIDO validator set. And we also have a large labs division, which actually develops the products on top of blockchains. Yeah, that is fascinating. Quite a lot more than just your typical venture fund. Would, would you be able to speak a little bit about what the reasoning was behind taking such a builder first approach, then instead of just being a capital allocator, you were also building products yourselves? So. Like there is so much to develop right now. And, and we realized very early, like you cannot invest into blockchain space through Excel and PowerPoint. Yeah. You actually have to like touch the tech and you have to see, you have to go on discord and see how validators are actually, you know, organizing the, the network, how the network is governed. And that was our main worry initially. So we created a product called observatory.zone. You can go on the website, observatory.zone. And it's a very nice dashboard on health of blockchains. You see decentralization, you see health of RPC network. You see also very interesting that you can click on the Cosmos hub, basically, which is Atom. And you see the top validators. Number one is Coinbase with 17 million Atom. 
but they take 20% fee. They don't participate to governance and they run their servers on Amazon in Ireland. So you as a foundation, do you want such a validator who is expensive, not helping you in the governance and super centralized? Yeah. <laughs> and so we basically just help the foundations who are developers like our friends and tell them, Hey, like, you know, you should probably think about like who your validators are. And then we develop for them like foundation delegation programs. For example, they allocate 10 million of tokens. Then we help them to automatically every 14 days put it onto validators who deserve it most because they are, you know, they have significant uptime, they are decentralized, they are well run, helping in in also the governance processes. And we also have a solution called Stakebar, stakebar.io, where you can connect your own wallet and just allocate your stake to those validators who, who deserve it most. So that was the main reasoning. Number one, to make sure we touch the tech because otherwise I felt we would not be credible as an investor. And number two is just to provide value to our portfolio companies. Got it. And that is a really clear differentiator also to other capital allocators in this space. I feel that you are kind of in a vertical of its own for the time being. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I would say like they are all French, like we invest into them, you know, like this space is so, is so broad, so complex that you like, you cannot be experts on everything. But I, I don't know many VCs who actually have these, uh, I would say, technical divisions. In addition to like technical divisions on the infra side, I would say we also provide liquidity to protocols, which I think is important because, you know, as a result of this, we help founders ship their products faster. So I don't think it's enough to just invest into their equity and tokens, because then if, if it's a lending protocol, or an AMM pool, they need liquidity also that they need to bootstrap their traction initially. Yeah. And then we are also the first users of their blockchain. So I would say, I would say we are users first and then investors. And I think that's the approach that it should be, because you probably shouldn't be investing in projects that you wouldn't be a user of as well. So, so that is a great way to look at it. On the other hand, you have so many projects out there. Like, I don't know, our deal flow now is I'd say like five, five projects per day. Like how can you be a user of five projects per day? Yeah. So it's extremely complex. And, but I believe, you know, that's why you just have to choose a couple of areas where you go really deep and, and there be the user. Yeah. And for us, it's clear like DeFi and there and provide liquidity there. And for us, it's clear it's infrastructure and there just help blockchains to be better run. That's good. You you do need clarity. You need do need focus. You can't be all over the place, especially as there's so much going on within this market. Now, to really concretely understand how you work with and support the projects that you invest in, could you share an example from your portfolio that kind of walks through this approach uh, and also maybe speak a bit about the thesis behind the investment? Yeah, of course. So let me maybe give you two examples. One is ZK. We think ZK in the future will be much bigger than just Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Uh, basically ZK, I mean the, the generation of proofs. It's still a question where the blockchains would want to decentralize their provers, but I hope they, they would. And uh, Bitcoin mining is, is, Bitcoin mining is a 4 billion industry today. We think just generation of provers. And that means, you know, the hardware and the software in terms of firmware, that means data centers, that means the marketplaces altogether will be a 40 billion business in five years by 2028. And so we are actually building the full stack of solutions to cover the zero knowledge proof generation. So number one, we um, founded a company called MayaZK and those are basically algorithm researchers in order to accelerate the um, SNARKs and STARKs, so, you know, MSM, multiscalar multiplication, NTT, on, um, which means fast Fourier transform on GPUs, but also FPGAs and then on ASICs. But those are mathematicians, software and hardware guys. Uh, we'll be participating in the Z-Price competition this year, if you know Z-Price run by Aleo blockchain. So those are basically the algorithm researchers implementing, just improving the algorithms and their efficiencies to generate proofs, number one. This is a company we, we founded. And second, we invested recently into Ingoniama. Ingoniama is a player, is a 
you probably know Omer is a CEO. They had a company doing, for example, Icicle. Icicle is a framework how to execute those different algorithms on GPUs. And it uses Coda of NVIDIA GPUs. So Maya would then plug in into NVIDIA solution for them, the ZK data centers to have a better, more efficient execution of, of proof generation, because all they care about is efficiency to be able to generate most proofs and have revenue divided by, you know, their CAPEX cost and also their operational cost in terms of electricity. So that's, I'm going from the bottom to top. Yeah. So algorithms, then the, the APIs and the frameworks. ZK data center, we are building ourselves. We have 10,000 GPUs right now. Recently, we were discussing with a, with a potential deal for a company. We told them, hey, like we have 10,000 GPUs ready to go. They're like, started to laugh because there is no, no need for it right now. <laughs> but, you know, we are trying to be proactive. So, so, so we have these data centers and it's actually very easy to get access to GPUs because you don't need the, the latest GPUs, but there is a lot of light and demand from people who had GPUs for Ethereum proof of work and they're just sitting there. So that's what we have. And then on top of it, we are looking into potential investments into ZK marketplaces because how think, how we think this, the provers will be generated five years from now is, you know, different blockchains will send requests for proof generation to marketplaces and you will have some kind of auction mechanisms to send those proof generations to ZK data centers, which we have. And then it will be executed by Ingo Niyama and then Maya underneath. So that's how we cover exactly the full stack from marketplaces, data centers to firmware and to algorithms. That's an example. And, and significant business, significant growth. The market is pretty much not there, but going to 40 billion in, in, in five years. So another example is with our credit fund where uh, we, for example, provide liquidity to credits. It's a, it's a real world asset protocol running on Solana or we provide liquidity into Centrifuge. It's a real world asset protocol running on Ethereum, also Maple. They are both on Ethereum and on Solana. And, and on those platforms, we create pools or we provide liquidity. And, and as a result of that, we are investors. Yeah. So that's, that's, so I gave you an example from our infrastructure side, and I gave you an example from, from our the credit fund side. We also, for example, develop some products. If you like, we recently invested into Risk Zero. It's a execution engine of zero knowledge proofs based on Starks. And you can actually, and we program ZK Wordle. You can take a look, zkwordle.rockwayx.com. And you can play Wordle using ZK technology. So the server doesn't actually know the word, but it just tells you whether you hit it or not. It's a fascinating how well-rounded of an approach you have to this investing. I, I, I really like it, the way you're able to work with the projects throughout the whole tech stack and, and look at the market in that way, but then also like contribute by providing liquidity and work with the project and helping them develop and build within the market. That is great. Now, if we move on to speak about blockchains, because you focus, like you said, on DeFi and infrastructure, the base layer of all the infrastructure and crypto are the blockchains. So that's a good place to start. And that's one where still, as we're trying to understand the similarities and the differences between previous technologies and softwares, there are a lot of frameworks that need to be kind of built to understand how to best invest and understand the kind of value core potential in these technologies. I want to start with somewhat of a high level question to understand your perspective into the main differences between modular and monolithic blockchain architectures and specifically like as an investor, when, when you look at them as things that you would allocate capital into, what the main differences are there? Well, there is one clear difference is that in um, model of blockchains, one of the three key actions is outsourced to another layer. So whether it's execution settlement or I hate the word, but data availability, yeah? I think it's just a very confusing word. I would say like data proof or data storage, I think it's a better word, although it's not stored forever, but well, you know, outside of archive notes, but, but, but it's like, it's a model blockchains are blockchains where 
one part of the overall process is executed on a different layer. That's it. And monolithic is where everything's executed on like in like one operating system. Someone, I don't know who made a parallel, the, you know, monolithic blockchain like Solana, like iOS, I think it was, it was placeholder. And, you know, Ethereum is like Android because you can actually optimize kind of like different pieces of the operating system. Yeah. So that's, that's the key difference. And from an investor perspective, I think, I think, I think two things. Yeah. So we do invest a lot into monolithic blockchain ecosystems, but just Solana basically, yeah? because monolithic blockchains, but also Ethereum, yeah, like those are the two key we focus on, two key ecosystems. Monolithic blockchains basically right now should be focusing on getting the user traction in the applications. Because we still think like 50 to 70% of the value will be captured by the application layer. In modular blockchains, there is so much work to do still on, um, on optimizing the different pieces. You know, once you actually separate those three layers, execution, data availability and settlement, you create complexities because you know, how do they interact with each other? And if you have then different execution layers, like different L2s, like how do you do bridging, you know, for example, through, I don't know, storage groups. And then once you do basically the execution layer two, then, you know, do you run one sequencer, five sequencers, and then you turn them by a proof of governance, like DBA suggesting, or do you have some kind of decentralized sequencers like Espresso or Astiar suggesting? You know, the SJUS creates so much complexity in terms of, in terms of the technology. And uh, my feedback to us as an industry, like crypto industry, is that it's too easy to innovate on technology. Yeah. Like we are all kind of like introverted engineers. It's just too easy to go on a conference and kind of like chat with friends about some new innovation, but it's not how we will grow our industry. Our industry is so small right now. Yeah. Like 3 million users per day, like it's nothing here yeah? and, and even if you take a look, those 3 million users per day, it's like number one is Tron, number two is BNB. <laughs> so the users don't actually care about, you know, what's your, whether you are modular and, you know, if you are running on a decentralized sequencer. <laughs> and I would just say it's, it's too easy for introverted engineers to compete who is smarter on the tech versus just focus on the users and getting the traction. So in terms of our investments in both, we, we always focus on the, on the user perspective because we are a user ourselves. That is the right approach. And before we start breaking down the modular stack in a bit more detail, because there are many more components there, you mentioned that when you look at monolithic chains, you believe that at the moment they need to focus on attracting more apps because you see at the value accrual there will work that the app layer will capture around 50% of the value. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, on how you see the value capture working on monolithic chains, because like quickly, it sounds like with the app layer capturing 50% of value is a lot compared to some say theses that have been put out a long time ago, like the fat protocol thesis, where the majority, like the vast majority of value would flow to the actual base protocol layer. Yeah. And I think things are changing now. Yeah. And we can see it. And when I say application layer, I also include wallets there, yeah? And wallets do capture significant value because they have the order flow, yeah? So look at MetaMask, yeah, 75 million revenue. And which is more than, other, what is Arbitro, yeah, layer two, like 26 million revenue. Optimism, what is it like, I don't know, 16 million revenue. You guys have the numbers, yeah? But once you have the user, you have the power to basically set the business model. And then, and then you also have the order flow, yeah? And then you actually monetize the order flow through what does it mean concretely is that, you know, you can then upsell to the user different services. Yeah. If you have, if you are a wallet, like a MetaMask, then you can offer swaps. And then if you offer swaps, then you kind of, you know, can suggest the pricing you want <laughs> and just pass on, you know, part of the fees onto the underlying layer, like, like, I don't know, Unisap, for example. Yeah. So. Another example would be just outside of DeFi would be, for example, decentralized data storage. So you have providers like, I don't know, AWS, Wasabi now in the, in the US also charging 
like 10 to 12 dollars per terabyte per month i think with like decentralized solutions like impossible cloud for example you could do better or even filecoin yeah you could do better you could you could go down to like five six dollars per terabyte and i really like that blockchains like filecoin right now have like a b2b sales go to market yeah and they have a sales force and they're now proactively thinking okay like who are our clients on the you know enterprise because enterprise is willing to pay 15 dollars per terabyte per month and consumer is willing to pay five dollars per terabyte per month so they're now thinking really about you know who are their customers what's their go-to-market what what is their fee structure because they understand that's where the value will be captured because right now versus you know when we started 2016 17 the, the infrastructure in the monolithic chains the monolithic chains it's it's soft yeah? like there are no more technical problems of course like vitalik says hey like we still have to solve scalability we still have to solve like privacy and we still have to solve account abstraction but i think the tech is usable right now to get more applications being built on top of the technology i like look at solana like the blocks solana is able to produce you know to put more transactions in the blocks that they are producing and the trains which are leaving the train station are not full <laughs> yeah i think the infra is there and maybe that's why I kind of like, you know, some investors whom I, I really respect and we are all friends, yeah, are focusing on, on modular stack because, you know, it's exciting to solve technical problems. <laughs> but I think the technical problems are solved. So let's fill in the trains right now, which we already have, yeah, because I, 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 as I said, like the trains are not full yet. There is a block space to be filled in. Yeah, there definitely is a great analogy, actually. Now, then there are a lot of investors. I think actually most of them that I spoke with on this pod have very strong modular theses and are extremely bullish about modular blockchains compared to monolithic ones. Now, you mentioned that Rockaway, you are allocating capital into monolithic ecosystems like Solana, Ethereum. But how about your thesis for what it relates to modular blockchains? What does it look like? I hope all blockchains will become modular at one point from tech perspective, because it means that we as an industry have to treat and process millions of transactions per second. And in that case, Solana would have to become modular. And you know, Solana is now looking at, of course, data availability and especially data availability sampling on basically how to solve the storage problem. Yeah. And uh, you know, Solana itself as a, as a monolithic blockchain can treat, I don't know, 4,000 transactions per second, but not a million in order to do so Solana would have to become modular blockchain as per the definition, which we just said, which is, you know, outsourcing one of the execution settlement or data availability on like a different layer. So yes, we are excited by modular blockchains as a thesis because it's a way how to, you know, improve the tech. But I would actually say even strongly, I, I would say it should not be a priority of our industry. The priority should be to get more users. Like priority should be to get more users. Yeah? As I said, like 3 million daily active wallets. And you know, how much is it on like Solana? Is it, what is it right now? It's like 120K, 100K. What is it like 200k Arbitrum, like 200k Optimism, 200k ZK Sync, maybe also because, you know, because of the airdrop, but potential, but it's super small. Yeah. It's like, we are so, and when I speak to investors, like my role, main role at Rockaway X is to basically fundraise capital from traditional investors. Yeah. And I have traditional investor background. So I speak to those investors, you know, here in London on like pretty much weekly basis. And, you know, they, they ask me, Hey, like, what's the chat GPT moment of blockchain and crypto? Tell me use case, you know, and the impression of our industry right now within those, those people. And I think those people do matter if we don't want to be just like a small parallel financial system, but if we really want to be, you know, like a 10 trillion industry versus 1 trillion right now in five years, which is my base case, then I think we need to you know, tap into the 
people like ChatGPT did through, you know, the AI as a technology, then, you know, only then we will be relevant, I think, as an industry. So I would rather focus most of our dollars, like 80% of not only our dollars, but all the VCs, you know, the, like, I think how much dry powder is out there, like uh, 20 billion, maybe 30 billion. I think it should be, it should be oriented 80% of that towards applications and 20% towards infra and modular blockchains versus the other way around, which is the impression I have today when I go to ECC in Paris. Th that is, that is a very against the stream take, but I love it because you also are, are able to kind of break it down into components that are understandable and it makes, makes sense that that should be the case. The capital should be going to the application layer. Now, another thing that came to mind when you're speaking about Solana and how you believe it, it should move towards more of a modular stack is I would love to set up like a roundtable discussion, have Anatoly on and then you and some other investors who also had opposing views on, say, the modular the monolithic stack. Because I, I spoke with Anatoly a few months ago and I asked him this because I tend to agree with you that when we scale into a fully crypto native future where we have millions and even hundreds of millions of transactions per second, Solana's monolithic base layer chain scale to that. And Atali's take was yes. But I also like t tend to tend to agree with you that maybe there might be some modularity needed to make that happen. So that, that could be a very interesting discussion. It also depends on the time frame. Like I believe so much in our technology and I believe so much in the fact that it's needed. And I'll tell you why, yeah. My bank recently fired me. My bank fired me. <laughs> because like I sent some transaction on a crypto exchange and because, you know, like I thought it would be time to buy Ethereum, no investment advice a couple of months ago. And, and then they fired me. They said like, you cannot explain a transaction on your like monthly report. And I don't think it's fair. Yeah. And also like recently I was sending, I was sending some money from Czech Republic, where is my main bank account to, to London. And. I was sending $8,000 and I paid $500 in transaction fees, including the exchange rate, yeah, from like Czech crowns into British pounds. And I think that's just pure evil. That's pure evil. I, and imagine if you did this on the blockchain where, you know, the execution and the settlement, like of your, for example, Unisub transaction between the Czech crown as a, as a stable coin and the British pound as a stable coin, would be instant here. I had to wait. It was over the weekend. So I had to wait until Monday and it would be instant using Uniswap and would cost me on Solana, like nothing. Yeah. Like very, very small amount of money and ultimately on Ethereum through modularity, also very small amount of money. And that this is the, what I'm excited about. Yeah. And that's why I believe struggling in our technology. So that's why I believe we will achieve the 10 trillion industry in five years. It's like my base case, and we have it like really calculated bottom up through all the layers. We think the industry will be 7.7 .7 trillion by 2028. And, and I hope we'll have many more users than just 3 million daily active users. Yeah. I think, you know, do you know daily active users of chat GPT would be interesting to know. Don't remember them out loud. I think, is it over a hundred million? 180 million users. So let's assume these are daily active. Ma no, this is monthly active. Yeah. So I don't know what is the monthly active of our industry, but if it's like 3 million, 3 million daily, maybe, you know, monthly would be like 10 million because like we use it on average. Yeah. So I would say like ChatGPT is 10x us. So, so if we 10x the number of users by 2028, I think would be cool. Yeah. And maybe we can do it even more. So which would mean like 30 million daily active users. And of course, like everyone should do more than just one transaction. So just, you know, calculating like this, I think, and maybe Anatoly is less bullish than me because, because if we really, really need like 1 million transactions per second, which is like huge amount of millions per, you know, per day, then, then of course you would have to scale so on further. So, so I think it's just, we will see, but modularity is a technology, which, which I, I hope ultimately we will need. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely understand the thinking behind that thesis, and I love how bullish you are. I don't think it hurts to be that optimistic because there there are grounds for it, definitely, and, and the clear need for it, the perspective through which you're looking at it. And it's funny you said that your bank canceled you or j just blocked you because, honestly, I, I didn't want to cut you off there, but three days ago, I was on the phone with my old bank from Finland, 
because they had they had cut off my account. I have no access to my fortunately a bank account I don't use anymore. But there's a couple thousand euros stuck in a Finnish bank account because of a crypto transaction they flagged, and I'm now a high risk client, and they won't open it up unless I provide every single kind of uh, account statement from all exchanges. And yeah, probably not going to do that <laughs> for them. But yeah, it, it feels weird when it kind of hits you because I haven't had that happen before, even though I've been doing quite a lot of crypto transactions. I, I think it goes against freedom. Yeah. And, and that's, it reminds me of, you know, when I was young and again, we were in a communist country and we did not have the freedom to, to travel, for example, or, or say what we wanted. And I have the impression that the traditional financial system is now exercising just the same amount of, I would say, you know, limits to, to us. So it's kind of like goes against my values. So that's why I'm in crypto. It definitely does. And it is great to have a value driven approach. Now, when we think of the full modular blockchain stack, you've made it clear that you see the app layer capturing the majority of value. It would be really interesting to get a walkthrough of your full framework for assessing value accrual throughout the modular stack. So we understand how you see things playing out. Yeah. So it was, it was mainly prepared by Philip and Marek from the team. Yeah. But I said, Hey guys, like we have to, we have to somehow estimate like where the, where the value is. And so as we discussed, so the applications are closest to the user and controls the distribution. So that's why we think the applications will capture 50 to 70% of the value. Moving down the L2s, their main operating cost is data availability and CK proving. And so L2s still have a strong power of setting their fees. Yeah? And, and I think that's also a problem why today they don't have an incentive to decentralize their provers because it's just so much of their revenues. Yeah? So. Look, for example, as I said, like Arbitrum is $26 million. And how much does it cost to run a sequencer? Maybe 100K per month maximum. So like 1 million per, per year. So those are like hugely, hugely profitable companies right now. And I think in the future, however, I think, you know, because of the EVM layer, and also the SVM, like Solana Virtual Machine, I think through, for example, Eclipse, which is now firstly supporting SVM and EVM through, through Neon protocol, you will be able to actually switch from one L2 to another as an application owner, if the L2 becomes too expensive. That's why we think the L2's value capture will be lower and we estimate it to be between 20 to 30% of the overall value capture. Now the data availability networks is, you know, in the future in order to scale, like you cannot scale just by still storing the data on L1, because what can you put in a block right now on Ethereum, like 120K? How much is a transaction in every ZK layer? It's maybe like, you know, 50 bytes. So you can put like, I don't know, 2000 transactions per block on, on L1, but with first with prototype sharding and then with then sharding. So the DA layer on Ethereum and also solutions like Celestia. We actually have the ability to store this transaction data in a different layer. But I think, you know, it's just a database. So how much do you actually, how much an application in, in real software is actually paying to the database provider? Yeah. And that's why we think, plus we think there are strong network effects. And so that's why, you know, DA networks would capture, you know, relatively low, so five to 10% part of the value. And again, like the switching cost would be relatively low because you can just basically, you know, choose a new data availability network where to store your data. So, which brings us down to the ZK proving networks. So, but this is on the right, this is more on the settlement layer where, so on the, on the execution layer, you execute a transaction and you generate a proof and then you send the proof to the, to the settlement layer. Now this generation of proofs, we think it will be, you will have to settle more often than, than ZK Sync does today, for example, once every 24 hours. Plus you will have fast track for users to, gen to just generate their proofs even faster, even more frequently. Plus you will need the proof generation, not only for 
for scalability, but also for privacy. So there will be huge, as I said, like we think this industry will be a 40 billion industry by 2028, and it will capture around two to 5% of the, of the overall value, because you still have to, you know, pay to generate the proofs, which brings us down to the settlement layer. And we had a long discussion, like actually how much of the value would, would the layer ones capture? And we actually think not so much because actually you are now putting, you know, the of course, like most of the value capture will be up on the applications and the execution layer will be captured by the L2s. The storage layer will be captured by data availability networks. Underneath the provers will capture some value. Now, how much would you actually pay for settlement? Yeah? We actually think the value would be relatively small. However, there is a monetary premium for, for just the base token. So that's why we think, you know, it might be five to 25% because for example, in applications like, I don't know, friend tech, you actually pay with Ethereum to buy the shares of a, of a person to access their kind of like their friend tech wall. So as a result of this, you see that this might actually, what might drive up the price of the L1 native token versus just the settlement. So that's how we are thinking about it. That is a great framework. Thank you for walking us through it. Now, you mentioned monetary premium is one thing at the base layer that affects the value. I wanted to ask about, in general, what you see is the best metrics or KPIs that indicate the performance of these different parts of, of the modular stack. And, and maybe we spoke a lot about user activity. And of course, like active users are something that needs to be worked on, maybe outside of that. I would say like it's, of course, cost because... Like some of these layers can really be value extracting, yeah? Like at least right now, yeah? Like ZK, ZK Sync is a massively profitable company. And, and I just think, you know, I just think that the more we get scale and the more we get also like competing solutions and easier it will be switching from one to another, the more likely, you know, we will just like reduce the cost of some of these layers. And, and the more also like the model blockchain kicks in and will have more scalability. So I think the cheaper it will be to use our technology. So I think that's why I, I take cost also as, as a KPI in addition to, you know, users and, and, and transactions, but also transaction fees. And then of course, developers building on blockchains and also the throughput, so transactions per second. Solana has a conference on a breakpoint next year. So we are now like running through some numbers on Solana. And these are the metrics we are looking at. We are looking at actually, it's very difficult to know the developers. I know there is developer report by Electric Capital, but we, we look at downloads of NPM libraries, which is the libraries that developers have to download to be able to develop the front end for the application. And Solana very interestingly has the high growth since the Q3 2022, so quarter on quarter versus all blockchains which which shows that there is still interest a lot in Solana and developers are downloading the NPM libraries. So we look at developers, we look at download of NPM libraries, we look at transactions, we look at users, we look at revenue of the blockchain, which is basically cost. And here I fully agree with uh, Anatoly's view that this cost needs to be reduced as much as possible to make our tech more accessible. Yeah, those are the main KPIs. Yeah, I do completely agree with that. And especially developer activity is such an important metric for these early stage projects that might not yet have the relevant financial metrics available to analyze. And yeah, we showcase core developer activity numbers on Token Terminal, but that is definitely an area where we want to be expanding coverage of different types of developer activity. So I expect to see new metrics there in the future as well. But kind of related to that developer activity and the fact which you alluded to earlier in this episode as well is that we have a lot of introverted engineers in this space who are very fascinated about technology and gravitate towards the cool shiny tech and focusing on that but as investors we also need to distinguish between good tech and good tech that is also a great investment or can turn into a great business so what would you say is like the biggest differentiator between something that is just great tech and something that can also be a great investment or a great business I would say it's the market and the go-to market, yeah. And I just wish like the founders were more focused on, on these areas, but it's, 
it's starting to be the case, you know, like for example, Eclipse, you know, from Eclipse reached out recently saying, hey, like, you know, we are now thinking of a go to market to Europe. And Eclipse is a, it's, it's an L2. Yeah. It's basically an L2, which is kind of like leveraging Solar. virtual machine, leveraging Celestia for data availability, leveraging Ethereum for settlement. So it's like a combination of the best of all worlds, although it's optimistic right now, but should be leveraging the risk zero down the road for also the proof generation to become zero knowledge based. But you know, they reached out saying, Hey, like, how can we think about our go to market in Europe? Yeah? And they reached out because we are one of, one of the larger ones in Europe. And I think Solana is also really, really good in thinking about just how to reach more developers. They have KPIs on developers. They are creating all those hackathons. Last hackathon was 907 submissions. So, so again, I, but I think this is just, you know, normal thinking of an investor. Like the tech is not necessarily what, what will drive a great business. And that's why we recently passed on some investments. For example, you have this new wave of just really smart engineers wanting to build a central limit order book exchanges on chain, because then, you know, it's uh, non-custodial. So you have your own wallet, but it's, and it's on chain. So it's transparent how much money is there and it's super fast because, you know, through some tech. They are able to actually put the order book and the matching engine on chain. And they hope, they think, they believe just, just developing this technology, the users would come. And sometimes we, we challenge them on this and we say, hey, like, so how do you actually want to bring the users? And they say, well, once you have the liquidity, because then of course you have such a central big order book, it can be like a central across all different elements of DeFi underneath. So you can tap into liquidity of Uniswap. And then, for example, the first users could arbitrage between Uniswap and centralized exchanges or, you know, the limit order book on that layer. And I don't think it's the case because then we call the market makers, we call the potential clients and we ask them, Hey, so would you, would you actually market make on these solutions? And they would say, no, first they want to see, you know, how much money they would make. So I wished founders were more thinking about the value of their product for the end user versus just the tech. It's not build it. They will come. We're not there anymore. It was maybe 2016, 17, maybe 18, but not right now. Got it. That, that is well said. Now, what if we look at the broader market and zoom out a bit from uh, this just pure blockchain discussion, what trends or market sectors within crypto currently stand out to you or m might not be getting the attention that they deserve? So we are still a lot of infrastructure investors. We think of the 7.7 .7 trillion market size, we think we will achieve in 2028, 3.5 trillion will be in infra, uh, around three, yeah, 3.5 will be in DeFi, so finance 24 seven, which includes stable coins and payments. And then the remaining 1 trillion will be in Web3 consumer. And I'm actually excited about like across, yeah. So in terms of applications, I'm excited still about stable coins and its potential outside of US dollar, you know. There is 130 billion issued of US dominated stable coins. I think we need a widely used Euro stable coin. It's a great team called Monerio. There's a great team called Stasis working on those solutions. Circle is also, I think right now, number one, but I would use a Euro stable coin if it was adopted across exchanges and also DeFi, because now, you know, I'm based in Europe. I live here, but I get USD exposure whenever I go into crypto, which I think is not fair. And, and also Mika as a regulation in Europe is limiting the usage of US denominated stable coins to 500 million volume. So you get regulatory pressure from that side. So we need, for example, Euro stable coins. So I'm excited by that. I'm also excited about just on completely on another spectrum. I'm still excited by the potential of gaming and uh, autonomous worlds, for example, or just, you know, idle games on chain. So take a look at, for example, Angry Dinos. It's a game which is, a, it's an idle game created by a team who created idle miner tycoon. It's one of the top revenue generating idle games. It's a web two game and Angry Dinos is a concept using web three, 
Why are they excited about Web3? Is because in Angry Dinos, you create resources. So idle game is a game you play, you know, a couple of times during the day and we are not locked in because you are at work. It just works, you know, like, you know, your little players are doing something. In the case of Angry Dinos, you are actually combining resources to build something like a rocket to escape the current planet, which is uh, like under a threat. And, but if you create resources in Angry Dinos, then you are able to swap them using Uniswap on Polygon. So actually the economical aspect of those games is completely linked to the Web3 technology and the Web3 ecosystem. So that's what I'm excited about, you know, like fully on-chain games. Yeah. Those are some great categories to be looking at. And I say Euro stable coins are one that I would also be very keen to see more of. I've been trying, I think the last time I played around, I used AG Euro from Angle. It's the one I've been using, but it, it isn't too easy to use Euro stable coins at the moment. It's a very small one. It's like, what is it? A couple of millions issue. It's very, very small. Great team though. That, that is true. CEO is super smart. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, super smart guy. Yes, yeah, yeah I had him had him on the pod also a few months back, and after that, decided that uh, I need to support the project and use out AG Euro. But it using a stable coin, especially like an off and on ramp, it's so important to get the integrations in shape, like even with the centralized exchanges. And when you don't have too much issued yet, it, it's tough. One more example, I would say, we are still excited about DeFi, but DeFi is dead right now because there is no yield on chain. So you know what is now like Ave or compound yielding you like maybe 3% on USDC, it's, it's not competitive versus what you get on US treasuries yeah, in the traditional world. So now you have companies like on the finance, putting the US treasuries on chain, but I think it's actually counterproductive because it creates even more intermediaries. <laughs> so we are saying blockchain is disrupting intermediaries, but when we put US treasuries on chain, we create even more intermediaries. And so I'm more excited about just crypto native use cases generating more yield and there are none right now look at for example look at ethereum yeah so 30 percent of ethereum is in lido so you know holders hold the staked eth but 70 percent of them only hold the staked eth on their wallets only 30 percent use it in DeFi. And this 30% of staked ETH, which is used in DeFi, it's only used to borrow stablecoin against the staked ETH. People are not using it to generate yield. Maybe you have a ribbon protocol who is able to generate a bit of yield on your staked ETH, but that's it, yeah? But we need more like really interesting use cases to generate yield in DeFi. I think part of it will come from restaking, so solutions like Eigenlayer. But I think insurance is also a big, big segment which has not been disrupted right now with the blockchain. But in the traditional world, it's a, it's a massive industry. And we could really, you know, automate, I would say, the back office of insurance companies, but also help them to help them to increase the ratio of capital they hold versus how much they can actually insure. Because from a regulation perspective, there is a, there is a certain threshold. Uh, but we have some ideas also how to do that. I'm also excited by, for example, Athena. Athena, it's a, it's basically a yield generating stable coin, which, you know, or think about it as like a yield generating protocol. You have USDC, you give it to Athena, they convert it to staked ETH, and then you generate your, your yield on staked ETH. They're also able to execute on basis trade. So you get the yield on Ethereum, then by a derby, they hedge the Ethereum exposure and they give you as a holder of the stablecoin yield back. And I think that's very exciting. So I'm excited about all of these like DeFi innovation still. Yeah, that is great. There's a lot of untapped potential there. Uh, that was a good breakdown of a lot of interesting trends. Especially because we provide liquidity into those protocols. So, so uh, that's why I'm excited. Yes, exactly. Now, this has been uh, an incredibly insightful session. Uh, I'll wrap this up with one final question, because I mean, in, in one way as a fund, I feel you're definitely paving the path as you have such a holistic approach to the market and think about these things in such well-structured ways and building great frameworks. What are the biggest challenges that you as Rockaway X face in this space today? I would say information. And I think us as an industry, we are just very bad in educating the you know traditional world and take an example you know all of this fear uncertainty and doubt going around i think nick carter is trying to solve this on on twitter 
about you know Hamas being financed through crypto. And I think I think our problem is just basic journalism because journalists are basically shells people who are being paid via clicks on their articles. And you know it's just too easy to communicate on you know topics like hey like Bitcoin just you know rose seventy percent in value or Solana just lost you know. 80% of its value in terms of a token. I think it's just too easy. And however, I don't want to blame third parties or journalists. I think as an industry, we have to blame ourselves because we are not educating in a sufficient way. We are just too complex. And, you know, just to understand the model of blockchains, like, you know, L2 execution and then the settlement and then how does the data availability sampling work and the fact that light clients actually can scale your blockchains, you know, faster than linearly and all of these, you know, zero knowledge proofs and now fully homomorphic encryption, like we love being too complex and it's not helping us. So I think that's what's slowing us down. I think we have to be just, I don't know how, maybe we need to create just our own, a much better kind of like education portal, maybe just be more plugged in into, I don't know, universities, but, but maybe we could create a, like a think tank together, how as an industry, we can better communicate. So there is one source of data, truth, what you guys are doing in terms of, you know, just revenue and p and it's great, but I think we need more of that because right now, like crypto is a bad word in investment committees. When I go and speak to traditional like investors, not all of them, of course, like you have some who, who understand it, but. But often it's like, hey, like you are doing crypto, like we don't even take a meeting right now. Yeah, because, and then I ask them, okay, have you invested? And they're like, yeah, yeah, like we invest into Celsius. So I just think we, we have to like educate better and, and we are not just, you know, that we are not about fraud and, you know, financing of terrorism, but we are really like an automated financial system. I agree with you 100%. That is a massive pain point. And I feel that that is actually one big reason as well why we started doing these podcasts is to kind of speak about things that filter out the noise in terms that would be easily approachable and understandable by people looking from the outside in to understand what is actually going on. So thank you, Victor, for joining me today to give some context into what is actually going on and how you are approaching this space. I really enjoyed the insights you're able to share. I'm sure a lot of people found them very valuable and I hope we can do this again and maybe make it a reoccurring theme to kind of touch on the latest developments in the market. Thank you so much. Say hi to the team.